A very good evening to the ladies and gentlemen and all the viewers today. I welcome you all in the second edition of Oran City Literature Festival organized by SGR Knowledge Foundation. I am Tufail Sharif. Welcome you all for the session. I will be the anchoring this session and this session is of 40 minutes. At the end, there will be a buzzer for the end of the session. The topic for the session is the play of dolls, translation and the art of thought in Kunwa Nara's short fiction. I am pleased to welcome the speaker before the session, uh, Mr. John Watter. Sir holds an MFA in the Literary Translation from University of Iowa. The play of doll in his first book in translation co-translated with Apurva Narayan. In 2018, he was selected as an emerging translator from the US to attend the BNAF International Literary Translation Center Residency in Canada. His, uh, his translations his translations have appeared in the blog shares, the Asia Literary Review, Words Without Borders, Two Lines in many significant places. He works as a research associate at the Institute of South Asian Studies in Singapore. We welcome you, sir. I shall also introduce the moderator for this session, uh, Madam Juhi Kumar. Ma'am is a newly minted lawyer, has completed her BLLB recently, and she has a passion for creative arts and performances. I have a neck and I really admire with the knowledge she has in conversations and dialogue she does with all of you. She has won a few mood codes recently. She balances of technical mind and of creative mind and creative hearts. We welcome you, ma'am. And without taking much of the time, I hand over session to you, ma'am. Thank you. Hi, John. It's very, it's an honor to meet you and talk to you about such a famous person who was has such an who was an iconic figure in the indian literature so it's an honor to talk to you about him and the book you translated of him so yeah i hope you're excited too yeah very excited it's wonderful being here and uh i feel very grateful to have this chance to talk about the book at the orange city literature festival yeah so to start with i've made a model of questions which i thought the viewers also would like to know about the book so i'd start so the first question is, I've heard that you were researching in India about the Hindu literature and that's how you came into this profession and everything. So how was your experience when you were in India? How did you like the people here and everything? I just want to know. Uh, yeah, so um, I mean, one of the things I think that uh, struck me most being in India was just, you know, how welcoming um, everyone is. Um, you know, I, I think that it, even in the U.S., if you go to different cities, sometimes that's a little bit difficult uh, to meet people. Um, you know, but people would warmly welcome me into their homes and, you know, share dinner with me. Um, I, I made one professor friend uh, and she told me that um, uh, she was surprised to learn that in, where I grew up in Oklahoma, that, you know, when I was a kid, I would run through the door of my neighbor's house. Um, yeah. was, you know, very kind of uh, the feel. She said, oh, you know, that's, that's how it is here in India as well. Um, so, so that's what I think one of the, the feelings I treasured most, the welcome. Um, for the research, um, I uh, did go there to research Hindi writing. Um, I was very interested in Hindi writing uh, just because I kind of wanted to explore what was out there. There hadn't been a whole lot, um, you know, that was translated in the U.S. Uh, and even before this at college and, you know, other places, I had started to learn a little bit more about Indian philosophy, you know, the Upanishads uh you punch a tantra things like that uh, then i thought okay you know with the society you know this diverse and complex um, with such deep traditions you know surely there must be you know really beautiful and fascinating uh, literatures um, in the indian languages as well so that was kind of at the back of my mind um and then as one aside i was also kind of eager to escape the literary conversation happening in the u.s um so one of the things which i also looked at when i was in india was uh Bella writing um, and different forms of politics, different ways of thinking about um, relationships, power, how we are as people. Oh, that's great. You gave a very nice thought uh, just about it. So basically what drew you to translate these stories? Like why these specific stories? Like there are a plethora and varieties of stories. Why, why was this the specific one you wanted to translate? Uh, so, um, you know, there are, all different uh, types of stories um, and ultimately I think a translator is kind of like a reader um, you know we're going to translate uh, what we like to read um, and you know, I uh, 
have some peculiar reading interests, but I think the people might share them as well. You know, when I was uh, a younger person, um, you know, I had lots of different questions about life, lots of different questions about religion and how the world is. And so I think uh, some of the books that touched me, you know, the most deeply and profoundly were the ones that kind of tackled those questions head on. Um, so I kind of came to Indian literature in a very sort of roundabout way, uh, where initially I got interested in translation and other cultures through uh, 19th century Russian literature. Uh, uh, so, you know, I was in, in high school, I was reading Dostoevsky, and I also loved Harry Potter. You know, Harry Potter is great. <laughs> Uh, but I think it was really the way, you know, this Russian author kind of took, you know, different types of ideas and arguments and then, you know, through the power of storytelling, um, really set them out one another. Um, you know, there's a sense that you're not entirely sure where the unfolding of, you know, these ideas um, will go. Uh, so, uh, believe it or not, that's kind of also what got me interested in, um, you know, the culture in India and other places. Uh, and I kind of wanted to go out um, and find writing that touched me, you know, in some way that was similar to how these um, Russian stories had touched me. And, you know, if, if you say, okay, you know, how is, how is Dostoevsky similar to Kur and Orion? Um, you know, on the surface, it may not be readily apparent. You know, you have this Russian author whose books are thousands of pages long. Um, and then on the other hand, you have, um, you know, this Hindi poet uh, who is known for his preciseness and his brevity. Um, but I do think that there are some similarities, uh, especially in the sense of, like I said, dualism. You know, he kind of looks at different competing ways of being, different competing types of thoughts. Um, and he really sets them out one another so that the entire story is kind of a process of discovery. Um, you know, and, and being a translator, we're always eager to see what our, our readers think of our stories. And so I was scrolling through Amazon. Uh, oh, okay. uh, there, somebody had left a comment on the book. Um, which I thought it was a good comment in the sense that it also kind of captured how I felt about the stories when I first read them. Um, you know, which is that these are not stories that you want to race through, you know, with the beginning, middle, and end. They somehow uh, engage your entire mind um, exactly. you know, to make you want to stop and think. Um, so, yeah, those are the powers of, that's the power of the story. And that's, you know, why I was uh, very attracted to this particular author. Yeah, and it's been translated really nicely because I'm a reader too. And while reading it, I was actually so hooked through the story that I was, I was just, though the stories were not related, they were all different stories, but I couldn't just wait to turn the page and, you know, read everything because it was so amazing. And yeah, it is deep. So, yeah. So, like, like your book had a lot of reviews, very nice reviews and everything. People read it, people went crazy. So, in the, in the recent reviews, the stories have been characterized in a lot of phrases. Like, there was, like, uh, it was called an ethical puzzle. Then it was called, um, you know, thought of experiments. So, how would you like to, you know, tell us about what these phrases actually mean? Like, uh, how would you describe yeah. all of these? Yeah, so these are um, really interesting stories. Uh, you know, they're, they're not your, your typical story, and that's kind of uh, deliberately what Kuhn and Orion set out to do. Um, you know, like I said, he's, uh, you know, traditionally, um, you know, a poet, and so he kind of approached the form of storytelling um, in a very poetic way. Uh, and so, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of difficult sometimes to describe short story collections because a novel, you can just say, you know, okay, here's the plot line. Um, whereas the short story collections, you know, there are multiple tales. Uh, but Narayan makes it a little bit easier where he actually um, had a note to the reader um, at the start of the collection where he kind of explained what it was that he was setting out to do. Um, and he refers to his stories as uh, romances with reality, which I thought was a really, really nice phrase. Um, but by romance, you know, he doesn't mean romantic. You know, it's yeah. not, you know, a Bollywood story where, you know, a guy with a big chest will come in and tweet God. <laughs> oh, so you're a fan of Bollywood stories as well. <laughs> this, is not a, this is not a Salman Khan film. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you were saying. Uh, but he, he means kind of romance in the sense of the imagination. Um, so he kind of references Don Quixote in the way in which Don Quixote is a type of romance. Um, and one, you know, one way he kind of explains it is that often we think of a story 
um, or a fiction as a type of representation of reality, you know, like a story in the name of reality and the story just tries to approximate that. Um, and here he kind of flips that formula on it. Uh, where here he says, you know, actually what I'm trying to do is reality um, in the name of the story. Uh, so he's trying to create a method, you know, a type of a mode of storytelling that allows him to get to, uh, you know, reality, what concerns him more directly. And of course, one of the virtues of storytelling, one of the virtues of poetry is that, uh, you know, the imagination lets you do that. Oh, yeah, that's great. So you chose the play of dolls for your title story. I mean, why this? Is it something that connects all the stories all together? Why this title? Like, why the play of dolls? Um, so there were some different considerations at play. Uh, and I, yeah, the original story um, collection in Hindi uh, was titled Akaron Chaos Pass, um, which we had translated for the title Near and Around Shapes um, Elsewhere. Um, so the, the translation, uh, you know, being a new book is a little bit different. Um, and, you know, part of, part of the consideration was to find a story that kind of thematically touched upon all of the others. Um, and so we, I think what we liked about the play of dolls um, was the kind of fundamental concept of the metaphor there. Um, so I think uh, the original title was maybe Gurion Kakeo or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But the, you know, uh, the idea for a, you know, for a doll is often you have the puppet master, um, you know, who is pulling the strings. Um, and for a lot of the characters um, in these stories, uh, you know, there, there is a degree of powerlessness um, involved. And often, you know, what they're forced to do and how they're forced to act um, is not their own decision. You know, it happens by some kind of outside force. Um, but at the same time, you know, uh, Narayan is interested in the question of premises. You know, like, what is the premise on which we do something? What is right and proper action? Um, and so it also runs up against this metaphor of, you know, the strings, you know, controlling our actions. Um, there's also uh, the idea of this doll maker in the story um, who actually exerts uh, agency and, you know, her own um, uh, power in uh, interpreting the world as it is through her art, creating the dolls. And that's a very different type of uh, way of being, um, you know, as opposed to, um, you know, being you know, being pushed around by the concerns of the world. Uh, so to give to give the you know, readers and listeners a sense of what the story is about, to kind of make it a little bit more concrete, um, the story starts out from the premise, actually, of compassion, where you have uh, a, a, a passerby on the road who sees this boy, and the boy is uh, putting on this puppet show, you know, of all of these dolls. And then the adults, you know, near around, um, just keep on kind of passing the boy by and don't really want to give him the time of day. And actually, they don't want to believe that, you know, a boy of his size could actually fool them, you know, with some kind of magic artistry, you know, of this puppet show. And so uh, the passerby, who is our narrator, you know, gets a little bit angry. You know, the people aren't showing the boy his due consideration. And so he decides, OK, you know, I'm going to show some uh, compassion and empathy and I'll go ahead and buy these dolls from him. Um, so this is how the story begins, uh, but things get, you know, much more complicated uh, where he buys the dolls um, and then, you know, his own self-interest gets involved where, you know, maybe he'll set up a shop to sell them. Um, in the process, the boy also introduces uh, the narrator to his older sister, um, who is the one who creates them, um, the doll maker. Um, and actually a type of romance, uh, you know, develops between them. But what is interesting about, you know, the romance is that, you know, the two of them can't really see eye to eye. Um, and this is, again, kind of getting out some of the duality that I was talking about um, earlier with the kind of external compulsions of the world um, and also a type of more kind of innocent, uh, innocent knowledge, um, you know, where she just wants to, you know, get to know him. Uh, you know, she wants to kind of do this in a very kind of, uh, you know, direct, friendly way. And then he's constantly thinking, you know, what will other people think? Uh, you know, maybe this is not the appropriate way for us to be speaking to one another. Um, and there's actually one, you know, nice line when you know they're sitting together um, on this culvert, um, you know, kind of talking about, uh, 
you know, this kind of relationship, which is uh, budding between them, which I think is nice and gets uh, this concept, uh, which I'll read. So this, okay. is, this, is the, this is the narrator thinking. Yeah, you really give a very nice explanation and a description about it. I'm sure the viewers might have understood the depth and everything you were trying to tell them. So the next thing I'd like to ask you is what is the art of thought referred to your new session topic and how should we view Narayan's approach to thinking? Yeah. Like, um, so I think, uh, you know, one of another thing which I was interested in in these stories is that this idea of the, the human uh, comes up pretty frequently, um, you know, the human or humanness. Uh, but I could tell when I was reading that it, it, it didn't seem to mean, um, you know, the same the same thing as uh, humanity or humanism um, as I understood it from the vantage point of uh, my own culture. Um, and so part of the, you know, the excitement of translating the stories uh, was to kind of figure out, okay, wh what exactly does this mean? Um, and I think that uh, the role of thought, you know, plays, uh, you know, a, a, a sizable role in this. Um, so earlier I had said that, you know, one of my favorite authors uh, growing up was Dostoevsky and uh, Nurhan had also read um, some Dostoevsky as well. Um, and what is kind of interesting to me about uh, how the way in which both of them portray reason um, is that there is uh, a little bit of um, suspicion involved. Um, and so it kind of, it tries to open up what exactly do we mean by reason. Uh, so in, in the case of um, Dostoevsky, in a lot of his books, he has this like weird preoccupation uh, with, with this book at the time called What is to be Done uh, by Chernichevsky. Um, and the book is all about rationality. It's all about utilitarianism. Um, you know, it has, it's a lot of, it's very utopic. Um, and Dostoevsky kind of didn't know how he felt about that uh, because there was a lot of psychology of people that he didn't really think that this uh, you know, very mechanical rationality understood. Um, and similarly, in some of the stories of Narayan, even though in every story it is a type of ethical puzzle, it is a type of thought experiment, he is trying to kind of use a type of reasoning and thinking to get closer to something. Um, there are some phrases like inhuman reasoning, you know, or contorted logic, um, which show up in the stories. Um, so in the case of the play of dolls, you know, you have you have the man, you know, who is asking why, 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 and is thinking, you know, so much about the world, just getting in the way of, you know, his ability to know her. Um, and then, you know, all she says is, why do we have to be thinking so much about, you know, what the rest of the world says? Like, why can't we just, you know, get to know and recognize one another? And so I think for Narayan, there's a question not only of reason, but also uh, perception, um, and also, you know, trying to recognize the human face in things. Um, there's a story called The Official, uh, where you have a citizen who goes into this government office and he's been there, you know, five or six or seven times and he's waiting for his application to be processed. Uh, you know, and he says, why can't, you know, why can't you just give me a verdict? And then the official says to him, well, you know, uh, it's just government policy isn't such that we can really help you right now. Um, and so then, you know, as a kind of parting shot as he leaves, he says, okay, I understand very well what's being done in the name of uh, the country's interest and the not in the good of its people. Um, and so I think that he, Narayan is a little bit um, uh, uncertain or kind of question some of the different abstractions, you know, that we create for ourselves, which sometimes actually blur out our ability to recognize the human and one another. And my co-translator, Reporva, writes a very nice afterword um, where he talks about how what Narayan is really concerned with is this question of moral evolution um, and the way in which this world of transactionalism we live in ends up kind of, uh, you know, degrading us. And so this is, these are two of the core tensions that Narayan looks at, you know, honesty, love, intuition, feeling, um, but also, on the other hand, the external trappings of needs and duties, the ways in which we deceive ourselves and deceive one another. Um, so that, I guess that would be the paradox that he uh, was looking at. 
Yeah. So you just mentioned your co-translator. So how was it to work with Apoorva? How was it? How did you guys bond? How did you guys get through this whole thing? How was it to work with him? Uh, it was really wonderful working with Apoorva. Um, you know, obviously he uh, he's the son of the author and he has immense translation experience uh, translating uh, his father's poetry. He has one collection of poetry out called uh, No Other World um, and another uh, collection of poetry which will be out shortly. Um, so throughout the entire process, you know, he provided me with all of the materials and I had a lot of questions which he helped to answer. Um, so it was very useful uh, coming in as an outsider to be able to, you know, tap on his deep understanding of his father's sensibility. Um, another, uh, another thing which was useful, I think, is that, um, you know, these, these stories, as I said, are not your conventional short stories. Um, and so translating them was really a process of uh, discovery. Um, and Narayan, who, Kukor Narayan, who himself is a translator, um, has an essay where he actually talks about uh, some of the difficulties of translating different things. And, you know, he says everything that you translate is not necessarily equal. So, for instance, he says, like, a, a guzzle um, is actually quite difficult to translate into English because we don't have, you know, that same culture of, you know, saying wah, 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 you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> things. Um, and I think that for Narayan, part of the difficulty of translating was that, you know, kind of in the best of the South Asian literary tradition, uh, like, say, the Mahabharata, you have on the surface, a wonderful story, you know, which is really captivating, and yet there's a lot going on underneath. Um, and so the, the real challenge was figuring out how do you translate what is unseen? Because a lot of what is unseen is actually, you know, uh, touching the Indian reader's imagination, what they understand of their own mythology and tradition. Um, and so if you're putting that into English, you know, which is a slightly different system, you know, how do you do that? Um, so it actually involved, you know, hyper precision with words. So translating the story almost felt like translating poetry. Uh, we would have lots of back and forth, you know, discussing what we thought the stories meant. Um, and yet at the same time, you know, we were trying not to let our interpretations of the stories, you know, make uh, the stories themselves just kind of read like dull philosophy, which they weren't. Um, so that was definitely the main, you know, the main benefit. The stories, I think, are much stronger. Um, from this collaboration. Uh, and I guess to kind of like, you know, sum up, people think of translation as just a mechanical exercise where you see the word and, you know, A goes to B, uh, you know, but actually just as, you know, there is an art of thought in these stories, there's also a, an art of thought in translation. Um, quite a bit of thinking went into figuring out how can we, we best convey these stories to the reader. Yeah, okay. So I'm
sorry john for the technical issue i hope uh, it did not make a mess but okay so i was asking you which one is your favorite story i know it might be tough for you to answer that question because you have uh, put so much effort in all of them and you know you've loved all the stories that you've been translated in this book but which one is your favorite uh that's maybe the hardest question uh, so far um and of course i would want to say you know i love all of the stories and encourage all of the listeners to go and buy the book to read all of them um i guess uh i'm going to cheat a little bit so i i don't know if i have it within me to narrow it down just to one um but i can maybe like you know narrow it down to a couple and then say why i like them yeah yeah where you are listen to all of that yeah so uh you know one of one of the stories uh you know which um is dear to me is the story uh, the court of public opinion uh, and i think that's that my was, favorite too sorry yeah i and i think it was uh, really great just because um you know it's it's simultaneously really funny and comedic um at the same time that it kind of touches upon you know a sort of day-to-day -day, uh reality um in india and for the readers and the listeners who don't know um there's a, a thief who steals a bicycle and then runs into um, a buffalo which is crossing the road and then immediately all of these people kind of gather and they want to kind of adjudicate who's at fault for the you know person hitting the the buffalo and so the story kind of spirals out into a uh, meditation on justice um uh you know which is really great uh another story which um i really liked uh is uh the final story in the collection which is near and around shapes and it's much more um poetical and metaphysical uh and you know you don't immediately know what the meaning meaning of the story is and the subject matter um but it has kind of i think a very deep uh sense of um uh intimacy there like you feel in a very quiet space when you're reading it and so when translating that particular story um i think that i could uh, feel it you know much more than others um there's one called the shirt which is much more of a kind of conventional uh you know plot driven story um and i think that you know just in terms of regular storytelling uh you know a, a character gets into a dilemma and has to figure out you know how to get out um i uh really enjoyed that one um and then also this story fear which is about this writer at his desk and suddenly this kind of bug like insect entity enters the room and begins to take on different characteristics you know in proportion uh, to the narrator's fear you know which says a lot about our own psychic states um so i love lots of these different stories for different reasons but those are some of them that just I'm sure with these beliefs and the suspicions all the viewers who haven't read it yet were we were going to be very excited to read it and go and check all of these things out. So like you said um I just asked you which story was your favorite so tell me which story was the hardest to translate I mean which was the story which which took you a lot of time and a lot of thinking and everything to translate it properly like you did. Um so for Apurva and I both uh you know like I said we we conferred a lot on how to translate the different stories um and the different some of the different stories because they like i said you know in their romance like they they're approaching reality in different ways um and so actually the structure and language um would change um and so this would kind of create new challenges so i would say two of them which were particularly difficult one is a story called the mughal sultanate and the bishti um which is kind of located in uh Mughal era India um and i think a lot of translators uh, struggle with the question of how do you capture the feeling of a time period through the vocabulary yeah. uh, which doesn't necessarily have uh you know an equivalent in english um so you know in trying to recreate the durbar of the Mughal court you know we felt like we should use words like um amir and amir hajib um and uh you know things like that um uh whereas if you put a medieval english term like chamberlain um you know or kind of like terms within the uh, medieval tradition of europe it wouldn't kind of create the same feel um but that also created the difficulty where because there are so many you know words that were somewhat foreign that we were importing into the language um you know it causes tension of how do you make the story read fluidly and read naturally 
uh, when you're confronted with a lot of new terminologies, you know, and every other word. So we partially addressed that with the glossary, but we did our best to make sure that the story um, was self-evident in the way that it told itself. Uh, another story, uh, which was very difficult, was she. Um, and this was difficult for a very different reason, um, in the sense that uh, here the author was touching upon a lot of um, very sort of metaphysical uh, themes. It's a story about uh, the author's relationship and contemplation of beauty. Uh, but the title of the story in Hindi is just Waha. And every time, every time, you know, this, uh, this muse, this goddess, beauty, whatever she is, and the story is referred to, it's just as Waha. And so, like, you know, in, in Hindi, there's a nice ambivalence and non-determinacy to certain terms where one thing can actually mean many different things. Uh, whereas in English, you know, is it he, she, or it? You know, which one is it? And yeah. language, language will just force you to have to make a decision. So the challenge of this story was to make sure that, you know, within the confines of English, we could allow for as many interpretations as possible, because if the story is working on multiple levels, you know, you want all of those levels to come through. You don't want it to be, you know, any single one. Yeah, so nice. So um, tell me that there were a lot of reviews and everything. In one of the reviews, I read that this book where Narayan tries to take out the human through the inhuman. So this phase is the, the 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 phase that the human through the inhuman just got me hooked and it's so deep. So would you like to just put some light onto it? Like what does it actually try to surface and mean? Or what you thought the review had to say, or what you think, what is your view about it? Yeah. Um so uh one of one of the questions which Narayan asks, not just in his stories, but also in a lot of his poetry, um, and this is kind of what I was explaining, uh, trying to get at before, is, you know, what, what does it mean uh, to be human? Um, and also the question of, like, what does it mean to survive as human? Um, and so I think uh, that, that part of what he links, um, you know, being human to um, is also uh this concept of um uh in innocence you know in a type of uh subtle way at, at looking at the world which is not based purely on our own uh, self-interest you know or what we can get out of things so you know if you say things like oh he you know showed great humanity in his actions you know well, that was a very human thing to do um you know there, there's something that we mean by that uh and I think what what he what he probes is like this uh, this virtue of, of subtle thinking, and I think there is possibly a correlation between um, a, 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 the way in which we try to think through things in a very sort of uh, distinct and particular way, a, a singular way, versus making very kind of broad categorizations. Um, so, like I said before, often, you know, when we create abstractions, which you, you know, are types of categories, you know, we say this person is like this, that person is like that, happiness is happiness, you know, love is love, you know, a human is a human. Um, but I think, you know, Narayan as a sort of investigative poet is really using these stories um, to question, you know, a lot of these precepts. Um, there's one story called Achala and Achal, um, where uh, you know, the girl says that, you know, she loves the boy um, and the boy, you know, thinks about what it means to love her and he thinks, uh, okay, you know, I think given all of my different needs in life, um, I can maybe afford 40% of love. I can maybe love her 40%. And, you know, it's, it's a bit ridiculous because when we think about love, we think, okay, this is, you know, infinite, this is absolute. Unconditional. Yeah. Unconditional, this is transcendent. And so you see Narayan doing this on many occasions where he takes something which we perceive, you know, to be, um, you know, absolute in some way and in another context that's, you know, happiness. Um, and then he kind of tries to question it. Uh, and I don't think it would be easy to say that, um, you know, one, one of the, the reasons that, you know, he's a great writer is that there's a paradox, you know, in his work. And so it's not like he's saying, um, that one shouldn't love unconditionally, you know, compassion is there, 
Um, and yet also what he's questioning though is that all of the worldly trappings and external compulsions that love exists within and how those have to be navigated. Um, so I would say that like, you know, like, like I said before, um, you know, there's an act, how we act, how we see things, our perception, um, and being able to recognize in the other what is human. And that is not just, you know, with other people. Um, I think it can also be with uh, nature. Um, you know, it can be with, uh, uh, you know, the sky or, you know, if, if we're thinking about, you know, things beyond, you know, what is purely earthly. Um, and again, I think that uh, Aporva does a very good job where he tries to kind of dissect some of this in the, the afterword. Yeah, maybe that's why Naran is known as the finest and the greatest thinker of all, because his thinking is really beyond what a person can. And that's what he portrays it in his stories. So that's the most amazing part about it. So we're almost at the end of the show. So just tell me your altogether experience and would you want to translate more such nice, great beauties in the upcoming thing? And how is the response there? You're in all experience and how do you like it and everything? Uh, my overall experience is definitely, uh, you know, to, again, a lot of, there are a lot of metaphors for, for translation, but uh, I think it's helpful to Try to think about the work that you're doing in terms of the way in which the original artist or author was thinking about it. Uh, one of the, um, the ways uh, that Narayan thought about writing um, and translation of things is, you know, the idea of having a conversation, um, you know, to be in dialogue with something. Um, and definitely, uh, you know, for this experience, I was in dialogue with a different language, in dialogue with a different culture, um, in dialogue with a different translator, um, in dialogue with a lot of you know my own belief systems. Um, and so once you kind of go through the process, and you know it, it is very much a relational process, uh, you come out transformed, having learned something new. Um, so I would uh, uh, definitely encourage others. Um, to translate. Um, I would encourage others to read the book to be transformed in the same way that I was. Um, and definitely uh, translation is something I'm going to continue to be doing in the future. So having some It was like you showed us that literature can join us beyond the boundaries also. So thank you so much for joining this session and thank you so much Jee Ma'am for moderating this session. I extend my gratitude to the publisher Penguin Classics uh, on behalf of Foreign City Literature Festival. Uh, we sincerely express our gratitude towards your acceptance for the session and knowledge share with us. Thank you so much. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. So thank you, Jim. Sorry for all the technical difficulties. Yeah, I'm sorry too. But then it was a great session. It was a pleasure talking to you, John. Thank you so much. Hope to see you soon in India again. But yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you. 20 years of existence. Two universities. 23 educational institutes. 137 courses. Sony Group of Institutions. A vision beyond.